and we are ready to start. All right. So, welcome to. Um, hope, hopefully, you've been enjoying Farpoint so far. Um, I'm Dr. Tom, Tom Holtz, and I am here to present a talk on what's new in the world of dinosaurs. So, um, as I will highlight in a forthcoming slide, uh, we are going to be using the, the Q&A function because this is a webinar rather than a standard style. Oh, hang on, killing those um, subtitles. Rather than the standard style um, Zoom meeting that we are all far too used to. But if you do want to uh, post things in chat as well, we'll probably pick those up. So, um, all right. So what's new in the world of dinosaurs. Also, if you're in so inclined, if you do want to do any live tweeting of it, uh, tag it as Farpoint Dinos and uh, tag me along with it so I can see it. And again, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function rather than chat. Okay, so this panel is going to be about recent discoveries in the world of dinosaurs. In fact, focusing on the dinosaurs themselves, but I'll be addressing a few issues discovered with regard to their close relatives. So who am I? For those who've never met me yet, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist at the University of Maryland. And for some people, a dinosaur paleontologist sounds like a redundant uh, term, but in fact, the vast majority of paleontologists do not work on dinosaurs, but I do. And when I can, I like to get out in the fields. Uh, otherwise, I also like to get out to museums to work on the collections. And sadly, of course, for obvious reasons, those have been difficult things to do lately. So I've been working at home uh, and teaching from home for the most part. So just so that we're all on the same page, uh, these creatures that we see on the screen right now, lovely and magnificent as all of them are, are not dinosaurs. So like most cases, we got to define our terms first before we can actually discuss things in any uh, accurate detail. So this, for instance, is a giant ground sloth, perfectly good mammal. Uh, Dimetrodon is a proto mammal, uh, a creature on the line to mammals, but not yet a mammal themselves. Mosasaurs and plesiosaurs were marine reptiles that were contemporaries of dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs themselves. In fact, mosasaurs were honest to goodness lizards. I mean, I don't mean lizards in sort of the general sense. I mean, specifically, they're cousins of skinks and beardies and monitor lizards. And pterosaurs, uh, the pterodactyls in their kin, although not dinosaurs, were very, very, very close cousins. And indeed, one of the items I'll be talking about is our new discoveries of the last uh, several months that finally show us what the creatures on the way to pterosaurs looked like. So we now have proto pterosaurs. We've actually had them for a while, we just didn't recognize that's what they were. Well, if these aren't dinosaurs, then what is a dinosaur? So the group Dinosauria, uh, which the English word dinosaur comes from, is that group comprised of the most recent common ancestor of these three dinosaurs, Iguanodon, Diplodocus, and Megalosaurus, and all of its descendants. So consequently, anything that would fall in this part of the family tree would be a dinosaur, but anything that branched off earlier, like, like Pterodactylus here, would not. But even in this restricted sense, you know, dinosaurs aren't just any interesting creature of the Mesozoic, they're a specific group, even within that restriction, they are a wonderful and magnificent group, uh, highly diverse, many different modes of life, all sorts of sizes and shapes. This image shows them to scale for the most part for body size. So, and there are three major branches of dinosaurs. Uh, the exact relationship between these three actually is a matter of ongoing debate. One of these is the group called Ornithischia, the bird-hipped dinosaurs. These include things like the armored dinosaurs, the dome heads, the horned dinosaurs, the duck bills, as well as their kin. And I always show in the upper left corner one of the oldest and most primitive examples. And so when you see the little guys over here, these are not shown to scale, by the way, you'll see how similar the, the, all the first dinosaurs are to each other. 
then there are these sauropodomorphs, the long-necked plant eaters that include the largest animals that have ever walked on land. And indeed, one of the items I'll be talking about will be evidence of one of the largest individuals of a dinosaur ever found, just recently reported. And then there are the cool dinosaurs. And then there are the theropods, the carnivorous dinosaurs. That's the group I work on. Um, this group is the one group that remained bipedal, two-legged throughout their ancestry. Um, and it's the one group that survives today. In fact, as someone has pointed out, Jennifer uh, has pointed out in the chat. So theropods include the carnivorous dinosaurs. However, there are many non-carnivorous members of the carnivorous dinosaur group. And that sounds weird, but you know, we have today the panda, which is a member of a group called carnivora, but it primarily eats bamboo. And indeed, one of the great discoveries in the second half of the 20th century was a recognition that dinosaurs were do in fact survive to modern times, that they include the ancestry of today's birds, and indeed that many early types of uh, dinosaurs were much more birdy than we appreciated. They were feathered, at least some of them could fly, and yet these are not birds. Um, and that birds just form a continuum from these small feathered dinosaurs to the living dinosaurs of today. And in fact, most of bird history actually occurred during the age of dinosaurs, that is to say, in the Mesozoic era. So yes, the living birds are indeed descendants of the most recent common ancestor of Iguanodon, Diplodocus, and Megalosaurus, and therefore are dinosaurs. Now, a little bit about the range in time. The oldest dinosaurs are from very close to the beginning of the late Triassic epoch. That puts them about 235 million years ago. No one will be surprised if and when we find them a little older. Um, so in you know 240 or so million years ago, because by the early 230s, they've already branched into a couple different lineages. The classic dinosaurs of the Jurassic are from about 150 million years ago. These would be things like Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus and Brachiosaurus and so forth. And then Tyrannosaurus rex, Triceratops, Pachycephalosaurus, the last of the giant dinosaurs were from about 66 million years ago. And some of them, if they were looking the right or perhaps the wrong direction, may have seen the impact or at least the flash from the impact that ended the age of dinosaurs, but not the dinosaurs themselves, since they're still with us. And so we are up here uh, in modern times. And I should point out the cliche, but we were required, paleontologists are required to point this out whenever we have the opportunity. Tyrannosaurus rex lives closer in time to you and me than it did to Stegosaurus. And the time between Tyrannosaurus and Stegosaurus is only halfway back to the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs have been found on every continent, including Antarctica, those spots of Antarctica that do appear above the ice. And we're finding new dinosaurs all the time. So these were all the new dinosaur species named last year. Let's do the new Mesozoic dinosaur species. So I'm excluding birds from the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, including today. But this is uh, dinosaurs, or more properly, dinosauromorpha uh, in 2020, we had 44 species, and this shows that we're naming about one species, uh, not quite one a week, but pretty close to it. And so far this year, um, look, it's been a hard year for everyone. <laughs> Only one new dinosaur species has been named so far this year. Uh, hopefully that will change. This is an incredibly slow year. Uh, you know, in all the years that I've actually, which has been since 2003, when I'm writing down what new species are named every year, yeah, this is by far the slowest, but hopefully it will change. And so here's my chart of the data I've collected so far. Um, you know, we, I wouldn't be surprised if we'll be down here around the 2004 data, but we will see. Let's see. Ah, okay, just got a Q&A. Are the water-based prehistorics not dinosaurs? So I will answer that one live. Um, if you came in a little late, you would have noticed my uh, initial, um, my initial, one of the initial slides 
was what is a dinosaur? And dinosaurs are defined as all descendants of the most recent common ancestor of Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Diplodocus. And in fact, creatures like the plesiosaurs and the mosasaurs and the ichthyosaurs, they branched off far earlier, so they are not dinosaurs. They're dinosaur contemporaries, but they are not dinosaurs. Okay, so for most of the panel, I'm going to, or the talk, I'm going to talk about new papers that have been published uh, since last Farpoint that have, at least that I think have yielded important information about dinosaurs, or at least intriguing information. There have been far more than I'm going to talk about. I'm just talking about a, a handful of papers, but I'll also use this talk as a chance for you guys just to ask questions that you're interested in about dinosaurs, and I'll try to answer them. So, of course, one of the things that most of us are intrigued out, a tree, one thing that most of us find intriguing about dinosaurs is that some of them were truly gigantic. And of course, when you're dealing with big things, the question naturally arises, what is the biggest? Um, and this January, a paper came out that suggested that they may have the largest or perhaps one of the largest, definitely one of the largest dinosaurs so far. Um, in a an amazing example of restraint. They did not give it a new name because unfortunately there are some questions of it lacking some of the bones that a likely close relative are known from and therefore we can't really say for certain. It's not an entirely new sort of dinosaur, but it's big. It's from Argentina. So the star that shows the locality um, and here's Argentina as a whole. This diagram down here gives us a look at which bones were discovered of this animal. And unfortunately, pretty much every bone that they found was not found in the original skeleton of another dinosaur called Argentinosaurus, which it is quite poss possibly a very close relative of, and which is currently the largest dinosaur. But that said, this new specimen, uh, which is not the only long-necked or sauropod dinosaur in its community. Here's, here's it shown to scale. That's a, a two-meter scale bar. So that's Darth Vader lying down. Um, it is a giant compared to the other sauropods in its environment. And these two are distinctive enough, we know, compared to the elements that are known from the big guy, that they are not just juveniles of the big guy. They're entirely different sorts of sauropods. Uh, is this one truly the largest? Well, it's about 10 to 15 percent larger where there is overlap compared to this individual. This is the, um, the specimen reconstructed. It's not complete, but it's fairly complete of a dinosaur called Patagotitan. And for those who have been to, say, the Field Museum in, Ch in Chicago or the American Museum in New York City, both of them have uh, casts of this specimen on display. Patagotitan is not the largest uh, dinosaur known, but it is one of the largest. This newer one's about 10 to 15 percent larger than this individual and therefore rivals the very largest specimens of other dinosaurs known. Um, Despite the fact they might be different species, it definitely is very close to Patagotitan and to Argentinosaurus, which is the currently largest one. Um, and it's showing that this group has the tendency to produce some really gigantic guys. I mentioned that they showed incredible restraint in not naming that specimen. Uh, on the flip side, some people show less constraint. <laughs> so this is the complete all, this is the all the fossil known. It is the upper part of the thigh bone of one side of the body of a dinosaur that was given a new name. Now, to be fair, it is definitely distinct from all the other creatures found so far in the same rock unit from which it's found. Uh, and the reason they felt they wanted to give it a new name, Erythrovenator, is based on what is known from this part of the body it does appear to be a member of the group Theropoda, the main group of carnivorous dinosaurs. If true, it's actually the oldest known theropod dinosaur. And they wanted to, um, to highlight the fact that they had the oldest theropod. Had I been a reviewer on this paper, I probably would have told them this doesn't actually deserve a new name. It's not necessarily particularly, as we say, diagnostic. That is, it's very difficult to distinguish it from, say, some of the other theropods that come later. But hey, 
you know, hypothesis, uh, statements of identity are ultimately scientific hypotheses. They stand or fall based on future data. So we'll see if erythrovenator survives as a name. It does, though, document the early presence of theropods and shows that indeed theropods were among the first dinosaurs. So from a first to a last, um, one of the discoveries that got described last year is the last of last, the last North American example of a weird little group of dinosaurs called the alvarosaurs. Alvarosaurs were possibly ant-eating dinosaurs. They have these powerful but short forelimbs with these great big hooks. Uh, they have a long beaky snouts with extremely tiny teeth. And they've been interpreted generally as termite or ant eaters. They may have used those powerful arms to break into nests and then lap up the little uh, ants and termites on the inside. I will say this was not the first discovery of this specimen, or rather of this species. There were fossils uh, probably belonging to this brand new species discovered back in the 1890s. And in fact, in the 1990s, I identified one of those as possibly belonging to this group. Um, but it was only more recently that Denver Fowler and his team found sufficient number of specimens to find, as we say, diagnostic features to show it's distinct from all other alvarosaurs. It's the last one because this is from the very same rocks as T-Rex and Triceratops, that last group of dinosaurs other than birds to live in North America. And indeed, it is cute. Now, we don't know of the exact pattern of feathers on its body, although it almost certainly was fuzzy or feathered. But I, I think that's a very nice restoration of it. Another first and last um, is the, the finally the discovery of an African duckbill dinosaur. Now, duckbills, hadrosaurids, that is, have been known from many continents. Uh, but Africa was one that we didn't yet find them in until last year. The specimen found is smallish. So you could see it compared here. Small, the individual would have been smaller than a camel. But since all that we have is one of the jaw bones, uh, which is very distinctive for a duckbill, it may have gotten quite larger. We don't know. It's part of a newly discovered formation in Africa uh, that includes the very youngest non-bird dinosaurs of Africa. So what's going on in Northern Africa at the same time that um, Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops were over here in North America. And so here's a map of the latest duckbills of Europe and this form in North Africa. And this is a family tree of the duckbills color coded towards the place that the fossils were found. And it turns out this African form is nested within the family, technically a subfamily here, um, of European duckbills. And so these are the European duckbills. Here's this African one. And it looks as if it may have been a migrant out of Europe into Africa. Now, there was no direct land connection, but there were islands uh, that eventually throughout geologic history got swept up and are now forming part of the southern coast of France and Spain. Those could have served as stopping spots for these forms as they're migrating across there because Europe as a whole was an archipelago at the time. Picture something like Indonesia and some of these were either swimming or getting washed from one island to the next and colonizing it and so forth. And so eventually some of them seem to have made it to Northern Africa. Now, here's another first rather than another last. It is the oldest of a group called eusauropods. So within the long-necked sauropodomorphs, there's a group called sauropoda. Within the sauropoda, there's a group that's called the eusauropoda, which is a rather judgmental name. It means the good sauropods or true sauropods. They're distinguished by a number of different particular traits. This is the group that includes things like famous Brachiosaurus and Brontosaurus and Diplodocus and Patagotitan and so forth. But here's an early one. And the discovery that they found included not just the fossils of this new species, but new radiometric dates for the rocks uh, 
that it was found in and some of its later relatives and earlier relatives. And they managed to bracket it here. They have an ash bed below and above the, uh, the unit with the rock with the fossils in it. They've got the radiometric dates here so they can pin down the range it was found in. And one interesting thing they've pointed out is that the rise or the first appearance of these used sauropods from the previous sauropodomorph ancestors coincides with some changes in the types of trees that existed. And um, uh, here we could see this, this sort of bar here represents a time of transition. Uh, so here are the earlier sauropodomorphs, here are the later used sauropods. And this change is a time that's also noted for a lot of volcanic activity. And part of their model suggests that the environment was changing in such a way it was favoring these new and taller trees that may have favored these newer and much larger and longer necked plant eaters as the creatures that fed on them. Ah, and the, did the trees get bigger? And that's what it seems to be. The trees themselves, or at least these new groups of tall trees, uh, seem to have become a lot more common at that point and dominated much of the rest of the Mesozoic. Yes, yeah, those are cute kissing turtles. And then there are sometimes little bits of weirdness uh, in the fossil record that we're trying to sort out in detail. Here is the skull of an early bird, or is it? We'll get to that in a moment, uh, from Madagascar, from the late Cretaceous of Madagascar, from rocks that have already been explored and have already yielded some interesting dinosaurs. And these were extremely fragile bones. Here you can see the bones while they're still in the rock. But thankfully, CT scans have been uh, developed that are really so good. You could take them, separate the individual bones digitally, and then reassemble. So sort of try to reduce the effects of the compression and breakage that happened during fossilization to get a more complete skull. And the interesting thing about this specimen is it has a very, very deep snout, reminiscent of the modern toucans. Um, now, we don't know if there were, you know, ancient Malagasy fruit loops that it was chasing, but, um, but it does have a, a toucan-like profile. And that's an unusual skull shape. Here it is, among Mesozoic birds. Uh, these are the snouts of Mesozoic birds. Well, Gallus is not a Mesozoic bird. Gallus is a chicken. But the rest of these are Mesozoic ones. Um, and you can see here this creature is. Um, all these creatures here are um, very different in shape. So suggesting it had a very different ecology than did the creatures, uh, the other birds that were around there, if indeed it's truly a bird. And the reason I asked that question, and others have asked that question, is there is a small raptor dinosaur that's only been known from its shoulder back, except for its lower jaw in previous discoveries from exactly the same rocks. Its skull, the upper part of its skull is not known and this is the perfect size to fit with it. So it may be that Falca Takeli is destined to be a name that's gonna be thrown out if it does turn out to be uh, Raho Navis. So I see what would the unusual shape be useful for? That's a very good question. Um, it's a deeper bill. So in some ways it might have been a more powerful bite. Its teeth are quite small. It only has two little teeth in the front of its jaw. Uh, and people are still wondering what that might be for. Um, so it's since it's only discovered, it's now up to the biomechanicists to try to figure out how it worked. Now. Um, sometimes we can use the CT scans to get us information of things that we would never have seen even when the creatures were alive because it's before they hatched out of their eggs. So this is a new titanosaur, one of those giant plant eaters, embryos. So it was found still within the egg. There have been some fossil titanosaurs found in the eggs before. Uh, this one, however, was very late stage embryo. So a lot more of the bones had ossified. That is, they had been, the cartilage had been replaced by bone. So they show up in the scans. So they were able to scan it out. This is looking at it face on. So we could see where the nostrils would be. We could see where the eyes would be, but the roof of its skull hadn't ossified all the way yet. 
uh, there were some interesting things they found with it. Uh, for instance, it seems to have this little bit of extra keratin, extra keratin and actually bone in the front of the snout. Um, that's similar to a little hornlet. Now it's not the same as the egg tooth, although the little egg tooth is also there, uh, but it may have been functionally equivalent as a type of egg tooth. And for those who don't know, birds and many other shelled vertebrates grow a little projection on their snout called an egg tooth or caruncle that they use to break through the shell when they're born and then it gets resorbed back into the body because they don't need it anymore. So this may be sort of a, a larger structure to help get them out of the eggshell, which might make sense because actually titanosaur eggs are some of the thicker eggs that dinosaurs produced. Um, titanosaur eggshells are some of the best preserved we have so far and they're some of the best preserved because they do have thicker shells than many other dinosaur eggs. Of course, we want to be interested in other aspects of the biology as well. And one of the aspects people wonder about is how far did dinosaurs migrate? Dinosaurs were, as a group, fairly leggy animals. Um, and so unlike lizards or you know sh other short-limbed creatures, crocodilians, uh, these guys probably could get up and move around quite large distances. And so some people have speculated that there may have been long migrations in some of these groups, particularly where we have examples of forms that are present in polar regions, which would have been not as cold as they are today, but they still get dark and cold in the wintertime. And in southern regions, and people have even suggested long, you know, thousands of kilometer migrations between the sunny seasons and the dark seasons. But how can we test that? Just because we find populations up north and populations further south doesn't mean that those populations were moving. It could have just been a widespread species. After all, we have pumas that are up in Alaska and pumas all the way down to South America, but it's not like pumas migrate up and down the Americas. Um, so this team actually looked at the isotopes of the element strontium as preserved in the teeth of dinosaurs and their contemporaries. The reason that's important is the ratios of strontium that you pick up in your bones and teeth and so forth come from the water you drink. And the sources for those waters are various uplands with different rock sources that are weathering away. So there can be regional differences in the strontium ratios that creatures pick up. And so they looked at the teeth of some of these duckbills. A nice thing about duckbills is that they kept on adding new teeth throughout their life, but keeping them in the jaws until they wore away. So this is looking at a hadrosaur, a duckbill specimen, and here they've color coded a bunch of individual teeth. So they sampled the strontium ratios of those, as well as the ratios of animals that people were pretty certain weren't migrating, like various types of fish and crocodiles and small bodied carnivorous dinosaurs. And they found that although the hadrosaur had a broader range of strontium than the other animals found at the same locality, and therefore um, it has, um, it was probably sampling from multiple sources throughout its life, unlike these forms, that the total range of sources that it had, which is the HI for hadrosaur individual, actually didn't even express the entire strontium range in just the part of Canada, the whole general region it was found in. So it looks like it was undergoing ranges of maybe hundreds of kilometers migration in its lifetime, but not thousands. So another question people have is about growth. And that is, did all giant predators grow the same way as Tyrannosaurus? Now, we're able to look at growth in Tyrannosaurus uh, because it's known from many dozens of individuals. It has been the subject of intense study. And so researchers, including my colleagues uh, in various parts, well, colleagues in various parts of the world have sampled Tyrannosaurus specimens of many sizes and shown that they can calculate the growth rates and the growth patterns, not just of Tyrannosaurus rex, but some of the other Tyrannosaurus for which we have lots and lots and lots of numbers. Um, here, for instance, are 
not even all the known Tyrannosaurus specimens, but a good portion of them, comparing body mass on this dimension and age in years on this dimension. And we see, for instance, that Tyrannosaurus remained relatively small until about age 11 to 12, and then it, it underwent rapid growth until about age 19 or 20, and then it sort of plateaued off. And that should actually sound sort of familiar because that's kind of what we do. Um, and that the shapes and changes of the anatomy um, change greatly during this adolescent phase, this sub-adult phase. So we see this in Tyrannosaurus. Did this exist for other carnivorous dinosaurs? Well, sadly, we don't yet have enough samples of multiple individuals to do the same exact study. But uh, some colleagues of mine tried a different approach, and that's use individual dinosaurs and then count their growth rings within the, um, the leg bones and other bones of the body and to get a sense of how big they were changing over time. And they found in particular, so these are examples from that paper, they found in particular an example of a what's called a carcharodontosaur. These are the largest of the allosaurs, the second largest predatory dinosaurs other than tyrannosaurs. And if we compare its growth pattern compared to tyrannosaurus, it seems to have a much longer and more gentle growth rather than this rapid phase of adolescence. Uh, and then a plateauing in a new form. Um, so a much more gradual change over its life cycle. And we'll have to see as more and more types of carnivorous dinosaurs are sampled to see if they turn out to be, uh, have the same pattern as Tyrannosaurus or the Carcharodontosaur or something else. Now, this particular paper I'm gonna talk about isn't about dinosaurs per se, but it's pretty cool. At least I find it really cool and some of my colleagues. And that is, we finally find out, probably, what the closest relative and ancestors to the pterosaurs are. And, you know, brace yourself, it's Ligurpetids. Okay, I know, no one cares. But I'll show you why you should care and why that's cool. So first of all, uh, so here's an example of a Ligurpetid. Pterosaurs are freaking weird. Pterosaurs are pterodactyls and their kin. Uh, the name literally means wing reptiles. It's the same tear as in helicopter. They show up in the late Triassic period, about the same time as the first dinosaurs, and they survive until the very end of the Cretaceous. We've long known that like dinosaurs, they're archosaurs, which is a particular group of reptile. And in fact, they are the closest relative to dinosaurs that most people have heard of. But their anatomy is incredibly transformed. Um, for instance, of course, they've got their big wings. By the way, in the case of pterosaurs, the long part of the wing is manual digit four. So you didn't have a pinky. They have a very long manual digit four. And so their wing finger is the ring finger. That's a way to remember that. But it's not just the wings. Almost all the anatomy of pterosaurs is highly transformed from the ancestral state. And the oldest pterosaurs we have, here's a late Triassic pterosaur, there's its skull, there's its wing already, it's a full wing and so forth. Because they're already so peculiar, it's difficult to figure out what their closest relatives were. And so it was uncertain for a long time. Now, we've known about this group of critters here, the Ligurpetids, since the 1970s when they were first discovered in fossils from Argentina and have subsequently been found in other parts of the world. Uh, the Ligurpetids, like another comparable group that lived side by side with them, uh, called the Lagasukids, were long thought to be the ancestors of dinosaurs, or at least the close relatives of the ancestors of dinosaurs, collectively part of the dinosauromorpha. And some of the traits that united them is they had legs directly underneath the body, what's called the parasagittal posture. And they stood on the balls of their feet. So they had what we call the digitigrade stance. Their ankle was held high above the ground. And the long bones of the foot were particularly long bones, the elongate metatarsals. And those are traits that they shared with dinosaurs. So ligurpetids traditionally came out as close relatives of the ancestors of dinosaurs. And collectively, ligurpetids and lagasukids were called bunny crocs. 
Um, Lagasuchus itself literally means bunny croc, and Lagerpaton means bunny reptile because they're small and leggy. Um, but this new study last year, using again CT scans to get data people couldn't access before, and a more thorough review of Lagerpitidae than anyone had ever done before, has them come out based on a number of features. Don't worry, there's no quiz, but uh, on a number of features of the anatomy shared between pterosaurs and Lagerpitids, that they are very likely the lineages on the way to pterosaurs. So as of the long ago age of 2019, remember 2019? Wasn't that a weird and wonderful time? Uh, back then, Lagerpitids um, and this other little critter called Scleromoclus were thought to be closer to the ancestors of dinosaurs than to pterosaurs. But lo and behold, this new study comes out and they move over here. Why is that important? Well, it gives us now better knowledge of what the ancestry of pterosaurs were like, and that pterosaurs came from little bunny croc creatures just like dinosaurs did. And that all those traits shared between Lagerpitids and Lagasuchids and dinosaurs were present down here in their common ancestor. So indeed, pterosaurs came from a dino-like ancestry, although maybe not a bipedal running one. Uh, people usually restored Lagerpitids as little bipedal runners, and they probably could when they were on the ground and being chased. But there are a lot of small bodied lizards, even medium bodied lizards, and even some, um, some primates today, which we call vertical clingers and leapers. And they actually have very similar profiles in terms of their proportions of their front limb, limbs and their hind limbs, and even sometimes of the tail included in there. So it could be that the Lagerpitids were more arboreal, more tree dwelling than we thought. And that from tree dwelling ancestors, we eventually got gliders and then flyers in the form of pterosaurs. Exactly. So uh, Jennifer suggests they may have gone through a flying squirrel like stage. And that seems to be reasonable for pterosaurs because in pterosaurs, like flying squirrels, like bats, uh, like many other uh, tree dwelling flyers, uh, there's a skin that stretches from the hand to the leg to the body all the way around. And that's different from the ancestry in birds. So the last big subject I was going to talk about is one that there have been a couple papers for, actually several papers for uh, this last 12 month period. And that's seriously, how weird was Spinosaurus? You can get people into amazing fights on the internet. Okay, I don't need to complete that sentence. You all know that you can get people into amazing fights on the internet, but you can get particularly ones in the paleo parts of the internet over Spinosaurus. Now we've known Spinosaurus for over 100 years, but from relatively fragmentary specimens. We always knew it was weird. Um, it's big, it's got this big sail fin, and even compared to its close relatives like Baryonyx and Suchomimus, it had some peculiarities to it. Then what's now, well, wow, coming up on, uh, on seven years ago, wow, more complete Spinosaurus material was found and showed it was even weirder than we thought. For instance, we finally had hind limbs for Spinosaurus, and they seemed to be disproportionately short. Uh, it also had rather broad feet. And what was very peculiar is that the bones of the lower leg were more solid than they are in other Spinosaurs or typical theropods or typical flightless land birds, and even more solid than something like a penguin. And having really solid limb bones is characteristic of some types of aquatic animals, particularly the early phases of aquatic animal history or slow, uh, slow moving aquatic animals. Think of things like manatees or dugongs. So uh, Nizar Ibrahim and colleagues suggested that Spinosaurus didn't merely feed from the water, as most of us had agreed already, but that it was an active swimmer. OK, that's cool. That seemed reasonable. And then early last year, this paper comes out. And in this new discovery, it was found that the tail of Spinosaurus had an extremely tall sail coming off of it, comparable to the sail on its body. So here's some of the actual specimen. Um, and here's the reconstruction. 
So we can see very, very tall neural spines, the projections coming up the top, and also fairly long projections coming up the bottom. And this was the reconstruction here of a big flat tail. Now, a lot of us would look at this and think, OK, that flat tail might serve as some form of propulsion. And they actually did a study as part of their analysis where they modeled the tail of Spinosaurus as well as some non-Spinosaurus theropods and crocodiles and the newt Triturus. And um, they found that yes, the efficiency of the tail as a propulsion device was higher in Spinosaurus than in typical non-aquatic dinosaurs, less though than crocodiles and less though than a newt, although it's comparable to this newt. Although I want you to remember this newt. Note that this newt in profile also has a big sail on its back and has a big sail on its tail. Um, all this I agreed with Ibrahim and their colleagues with. But they went further. They suggested in this paper that Spinosaurus was an active pursuit predator chasing down fish in the water. And that I and some colleagues were less convinced by. And in science, when you're less convinced by something and you think you can demonstrate a justification for your lack of conviction, you write a paper. And so was it really a fish chasing swimmer? Well, that's what Dave Hone and I decided to address in a paper that came out earlier this year. Um, so we looked at it, evaluating the ecology of Spinosaurus. Was it an aquatic pursuit specialist as the Ibrahim team suggested, or was it more of a shoreline generalist? Now, being a shoreline generalist doesn't mean you cannot swim. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't chase after some food. It just means you're not a specialized aquatic pursuit predator. And we pointed out a number of aspects of the anatomy. Uh, and this uh, diagram <laughs> is sort of complicated, but in the context of the paper, it hopefully makes sense. On this, black arrows point to parts of the body where the anatomy seems to contradict the mode of life. White arrows tend to be supporting it. And gray arrows are ambiguous because they are consistent with both models. And this is the shoreline generalist model. And here's the aquatic pursuit predator. Some of the attributes we looked at included, well, people had talked about how the nostrils of Spinosaurus were high, were back up on the snout and at the top of the, of the skull. But in fact, the little black dot here, that's the nostril. That's the nostril. That's the nostril. So that nostril, actually, it is far back on the snout. That's definitely true. But it's not particularly high up. By the way, this is the eyeball would be fitting right here. So this couldn't have been used as a snorkel or a, like the blowhole of uh, a whale or the nostrils of a crocodile, you know, just those and maybe the eyeballs sticking above the water. It would have to stick its snout out of the water or bring the whole top of its head out like this. On the other hand, if it's dipping its snout into the water to catch fish going by, it could still breathe. And so it could keep on breathing, waiting for fish. So that's one of the lines of evidence we looked at. And just for comparison, here's the skull of a stork. Here's the skull of Crocodilus. So you can see here, Crocodilus is able to get, that's the crocodile, its nostrils above the water and its eyes above the water and almost nothing else. You can't really do that with a stork. And yet what we see in Spinosaurus is more of a stork proportion. Also, we had issues of the idea of it moving fast through the water. Certainly, it can move through the water. And it probably did so far better than things like Tyrannosaurus and Coelophysis, and maybe even other than other Spinosaurs. But there's a phenomenon called wave, wave drag that's generated when an object is traveling through the water. And it has to do with the speed it's going at, yes, but also the profile of the object that's moving through the water. And Spinosaurus has a distinctly unhydrodynamic profile with that huge sail and giant body size and long neck and so forth. And what we've restored here, this is a meter scale, um, is how deep Spinosaurus would have to be in the water to avoid the effects of wave drag. If you're a pursuit predator, you want to avoid that because you're actively chasing after things which spend pretty much all their time in the water. If you are a generalized swimmer, though, then you can get up near the surface and just scull around and maybe grab a fish going by, but not necessarily chase it down. So unlike what some of the um, press came out 
with regard to our paper, we're not saying that Spinosaurus never submerged or that it never chased a fish in its life, but that it wasn't a specialized fish chaser. Um, and in fact, neither are crocs. Crocodiles are not pursuit predators in the water. They're ambush burst predators. And intriguingly, that newt that they showed um, was uh, the, the newt that they showed to compare to its tail, only the males have a big sail in that newt. And they also have a big sail on their back. And indeed, they use those tails and the sail primarily for displaying to females, in which both of those are greatly reduced. And we think that that is the more likely predominant explanation for the tall tail sail, as well as the tall main, main sail, so to speak, in, uh, in Spinosaurus. So we've got a poll that's up there now. Uh, in the post panel discussion, would people rather do this on Discord or Gather Town? So we'll let that run for a bit, see what people's uh, preferences like, if any. And uh, I should finish. Here's our uh, our uh, art that came out with the press release on that paper. And the artist here, Bob Nichols, uh, honored the continent of its origin by having sort of Africa appear on its sail, at least in an organic fashion. So now one thing I do want to point out is that although many of the museums around the country are currently closed, um, some are still uh, places you can visit digitally and the National Museum of Natural History, including its brand new uh, paleontology halls are available at this URL. If I were smart, I would have copied that in advance and put that in chat, but I forgot to. So uh, write down the last couple letters if you want and then remember it's tiny. U oh, there you go. Excellent. Good job. Uh, let's see if anyone else is voting. It's already been a minute, well, at a minute and a half or so, maybe we can close the poll. Or oh, you can leave it up for a while, maybe. I don't know. And that was, anyway, here was my last slide anyway. Hopefully the age of dinosaurs can give us lessons uh, about how we can conquer um, the current threat to our, um, at least our society in the form of the society of gathering together. Uh, and that is, you know, take the lessons of T-Rex, don't touch your hands, if your face too much, wash your hands regularly when you can and so forth. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. So I can take some questions if you want to throw them in Q&A. Um, and then I will head over afterwards to, um, it looks like, yeah, at this point, the votes for Gather Town do seem to be a lot stronger. If anyone hasn't voted yet, make sure you do. And then we will shut it down the poll in a bit. So any questions? All right. So it doesn't have to be on, thanks. It doesn't have to be about the papers I presented here, uh, although I'm happy to talk more about them. If there's other questions you have um, or things related to dinosaurs, happy to discuss them. I've got a, a few minutes here. It's uh, probably about, um, oh, great. Sorry, I didn't catch it earlier. What time period, uh, what was the time period for Spinosaurus? Excellent question. Um, and it looks like you gather town was, the most popular one. Uh, Spinosaurus was from the Cretaceous period. It was from the very beginning of what's called the late Cretaceous. So it was about, uh, say, 99 to 95 million years ago. So it is much older than Tyrannosaurus and company, but much younger than, um, say, Allosaurus or Stegosaurus. So any other questions? Let's see. By the way, I will be a snowman over in Gather Town. Uh, how many specimens were in your T. Rex growth study? Well, um, that actually wasn't my study of T. Rex growth. Um, 
it was uh, that of my colleague Thomas Carr, and I can't recall the exact number, but on the order of 40 or 50, which was quite a lot. I actually do have a T-Rex, um, a paper about T-Rex growth uh, but not studying the pattern of its growth, but rather its ecological implications, which I had hoped was going to be out by now. Um, it is, it's in press. I haven't seen the page proofs, so I'm waiting for those. Uh, two questions. Were there any fish pursuit predator dinosaurs? Second, do I have a favorite dinosaur? I'll answer that one live. Um, the fish pursuit predator dinosaurs, well, there are, and all of them are types of birds. So a penguin, it's an excellent fish pursuit predator dinosaur, as is a flightless cormorant. Um, in the age of dinosaurs, there was the last of the groups of toothed birds was a group called the Hesperornithines. And the specialized member of the Hesperornithines uh, were, they had no wings. Their wings were just a little spike. They were foot propelled divers, uh, but they were probably uh, fish pursuing predator, uh, fish pursuing specialists. Um, and all of those tend to have those more torpedo-like body uh, and because that's a much easier way to move quickly through the water. I mean, today, if you think about it, things like a mako shark or a bottlenose dolphin or a tuna are all the aquatic pursuit predators are all examples of that. And they tend to have really compact bodies and most of the motion is concentrated in just one spot. Um, and that way they can, they can overrun a fish and turn around, turn very quickly and so forth. In contrast, burst ambush predators can have many different body shapes. And that's why we think that uh, in the water, Spinosaurus is more likely a burst ambush predator. What was the coldest temperatures that dinosaurs lived in? That's a good question. Um, so the coldest temperatures for the dinosaurs would not have been as cold as they are in the world today. That said, dinosaurs of say the north slope of Alaska in the Cretaceous, some of them were enduring temperatures comparable to say southern Alaska or um, the eastern seaboard of Canada. So those are pretty darn cold. <laughs> um, and um, so I can't recall offhand the exact numbers. Now, those would have maybe been very specialized dinosaurs, although in terms of their skeletons, we don't see particularly specializations for them but some of those specializations may have been soft tissue aspects. Um, feathers perhaps, well, feathers for some, uh, and, um, but not for all of them. Some of these were groups that we don't know of feathers in them yet. Also, T-Rex appears to fossilize well. It, there's a couple, couple combinations there. One is it is from a formation that is extremely good at, uh, at getting fossils from both at the, a lot of fossils were formed there. It's called the Hell Creek Formation. It's one of my, it's my home away from home actually. It's when the Rocky Mountains were undergoing one of their last big bursts of activity. So a lot of sediment was shedding off of them into the interior of the continent. So you got a lot of sediment. So a lot of places to bury the fossils. And those regions have had some uplift since and are relatively dry, but they're not really hard to get to places. And so that combination of a lot of fossils present plus easy to get to means it's easy for us to recover more material from them. Plus, let's face it, T-Rex is cool and people want to dig it up. Um, that said, the, other, the two other large dinosaurs from the two other common large dinosaurs from the same formation, Edmontosaurus, the duckbill, and Triceratops are known from vastly more specimens. Uh, so it's sort of a geographic accident then? Yes, and indeed that's a lot of paleontology. You know, we only get information from where sediment was getting dumped and where those places of sediment was getting dumped have been exposed in modern times. So there's probably some really cool fossils uh, in the center of Antarctica or Greenland, but we can't access them at the moment. Or there may have been some really cool fossils uh, in parts of Canada, but when the ice scraped it away in the last ice age, they were destroyed. So that's, that's nature for you. Looks like I have about a minute left to go. So any one last question here, and then I will pop over to Gather Town. Again, I will be showing up as a snowman because my first Gather Town avatar was from a Christmas party our department did. And there are no dinosaur avatars that I can find. Or even dragons. Oh, 
All right. Any last questions? Well, hope you enjoy the rest of Farpoint. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. And hopefully next year, it'll all be in person. Favorite, oh yeah, favorite dino, great. Favorite dinosaur, right? I'm just go ahead and say it, Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's why I've got him behind me. Uh, he is my favorite, it is my favorite dinosaur, has been since I was three years old and not coincidentally the main dinosaur that I study. So uh, was my favorite, is my favorite, shall be my favorite. And uh, not to say the other ones aren't cool, they are, they're just not as cool. And I guess that's probably as good a place as any to stop. So uh, thanks everyone and take it easy. See you over in Gathertown uh, in the Derby room. I guess I will head over to the room I'm in. So take care. All right, that seemed to have gone well. So I'm gonna head on out.